The receiver now receives signals from two different directions. So we need to calculate the total received electric field, E total, which is equal to E direct plus E reflected. We have to calculate the total electric field before solving for the radiated power density, S, because E direct and E reflected may be out of phase, and any phase difference must be accounted for when we calculate the total electric field and then the power density. So first, calculating the total expression for E direct, not just the magnitude as we needed in part A, we're going to get E direct theta equals pi over 2 is J 60 I naught, which is 2, over R, which is 5,000, and then we have E to the minus J, and K is 2 pi over lambda, which is 6, and that times R, which is 5,000. Simplifying this coefficient out in front, and also removing the extra uh, two pi's, so we don't really care about going around and around with phase two pi and two pi more. What we care about is the remainder of after we take 5,000 divided by six, or this whole expression divided by two pi. So we're going to get E direct is J times 0 0.024 times e to the j and one-third. And if we were to convert that to degrees, it would be minus j 120 degrees, and that's volts per meter. The uh, reflected electric field is found in a similar way, except that there are three things that we need to account for. One, we need to account for the reflected wave propagating over a different distance propagating over R prime. So if we say this is R, we're going to say this is R prime. The electric wave, second, the electric wave propagating away from the antenna in the direction of R prime will have a different far electric field amplitude than the far electric field propagating along R. So in other words, this is going to be the theta here. It's going to be different. It's going to be pi minus theta i, the incident angle. So here our theta is different. And third, we need to account for the fact that the reflected wave reflects off of a surface right here, meaning that there's going to be a reflection coefficient that we need to account for. So first for part one, we need to use r prime. And we can find r prime by using geometry. So this is going to be 2 times the square root of 2,500, which is half the distance between the antennas, squared plus 100 squared, the altitude of our antenna. And that's going to give us 5,004 meters. So it propagates an extra 4 meters. For number 2, the new propagation angle is theta is equal to pi minus theta i, which is pi minus arc tangent 2,500 over 100, and that's equal to 1.61 radians. Now, this is only a small difference from the direct propagation angle, which is theta is equal to pi over 2, which is 1.57. That's for the direct angle. And so the impact on the magnitude is not going to be significant. And indeed, that cosine pi over 2, cosine theta over sine theta term is going to be approximately equal to 1. So the amplitude for the reflected wave is not very different from the amplitude of the direct wave. For the third item, the electric field is modified by the reflection coefficient due to the reflection from the ground. So as a result, we're going to have E reflected is J times the reflection coefficient of 60 I naught over R prime E to the minus J K R prime. 
To determine the reflection coefficient, we need to figure out if the ground is a good conductor, low loss dielectric, or neither at the operating frequency. So if we evaluate the loss tangent sigma over omega epsilon naught epsilon r, we get 0.04. And just for convenience, let's just go ahead and say that this is a low loss dielectric. It's pretty close to our threshold. From table 7-1 for a low loss dielectric, the characteristic impedance for the ground, which we're going to call here material number 2, and the air is material number 1, then eta 2 is eta naught over square root of 9 epsilon r. We get 125.7 ohms. And then from Snell's law, which you hopefully saw in a previous physics course, we have sine of theta t, the transmitted angle for the transmitted wave, over sine of the incident angle is k1 over k2. You're going to see in just a minute why we are solving for theta t. So we need k1, k1 is 2 pi over lambda in air, which will be 1.05, and then k2 in the ground, 2 pi over lambda again is 9.43 because our lambda changed. And we need theta i. Theta i is a tan 2500 over 100 using geometry is 1.53. So putting all this together, we can solve for theta t, which is 0.11 radians. Now, we don't have a wave that is normally incident on a material interface, like we saw in the wave propagation portion of this class. It's incident at this angle, incident angle. As a result, we have to determine whether the wave that's incident on the ground has a perpendicular polarization or a parallel polarization. Because these different polarizations of the wave have different reflection coefficients. And since the electric field radiated by the dipole is oriented in the theta direction, theta hat, when it reaches the ground, it's going to be oriented this direction. This electric field is parallel to the plane of incidence, which in this case, the plane of incident is the computer screen. So what we have here is parallel polarization. Here's a diagram of parallel polarization. Of course, this is rotated 90 degrees from our scenario. Here's material number two and here's material number one. But the concept is the same. And the reflection coefficient for parallel polarization is given right here. So you can see we have eta two, eta one, which we solved for, theta t, which we already solved for, and also theta i. So if we plug all this in, we get a reflection coefficient for parallel polarization is about 0.78. So what does this mean for our link that is longer and also includes the Earth's curvature? How can we figure out the total effect of the ocean along the entire propagation path? Well, to make things easier, the best way to ensure that the maximum amount of power from your transmitting antenna gets to the receiving antenna is to calculate what is called the radius of the first Fresnel zone. And then just make sure that that zone is free of obstructions and obstacles like trees and hilltops and buildings. The first, or in our case, uh, the ocean. The first Fresnel zone in a, is an ellipsoidal shaped volume along the line of sight. So the line of sight here is here along the dark blue line. And it extends between the transmitter and the receiver. And the radius here, R, of the first Fresnel zone so I'll call that R1 for the first Fresnel zone, is square root of D1 here to times D2 divided by D and multiplied by lambda. So notice that the radius of the Fresnel zone is a function of the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave. This is the reason we can't use our eyes to evaluate the line of sight between locations for a wireless link operating at 2.4 gigahertz. The reason we can't use our eyes is that our eyes see electromagnetic waves at optical frequencies right here in the visible part of the spectrum. The visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum has wavelengths on the order of 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, which are much shorter 
than the wavelengths our antennas are operating at, which is on the order of 12.5 centimeters. And that's at 2.4 gigahertz in a microwave range here. This means we can't judge the propagation path for a 2.4 gigahertz wireless link with our eyes because the radius of the first Fresnel zone at optical frequencies is a lot narrower and smaller than the radius of the Fresnel zone at 2.4 gigahertz. Typically, if we keep 70% of the Fresnel zone open, that's typically good enough. Any objects outside of the 70% zone causes almost no interference to the link. This table shows the required antenna height for different link distances. The first column lists the distances between the antennas, so we're at 15 kilometers. The second column gives the radius of the first Fresnel zone. The third column lists the radius required to keep 70% of that Fresnel zone open. And the fourth column gives us the additional height that we need to add on in order to account for the Earth's curvature. Putting all this together, the required height of the antennas to keep 70% of the first Fresnel zone uh, clear as well as the Earth's curvature out of the way is listed in this last column. So you see that we get 18.3 meters. So looking at this table, we can see that by accounting for the Earth's curvature, we've already raised our antennas up to be high enough for a 15 kilometer link. As a result, we don't need to worry too much about the reflection from the ocean surface. The 70% of the first Fresnel zone is already quite clear. What this means is that as the length of the propagation path increases, the required height for the antennas is determined more and more by the Earth's curvature rather than the radius of the first Fresnel zone. There are free computer programs like Radio Mobile can, that, can, that we can use to help us design and simulate wireless links. For example, Radio Mobile can automatically calculate the power budget of a radio link, the Fresnel zone, the antenna height, and so forth, all while taking into account digital maps of the local geographical information. Here is a radio mobile result for our link from Wayno here to UDOT. The three white lines, which might be a little hard to see, show the first three Fresnel zones. And you can see, perhaps faintly here, that the first Fresnel zone is clear when we use the antenna heights that we've chosen. Take out your in-class project notebooks and make a note about how we should be careful about multipath propagation. Describe what Fresnel zones are and whether our Wayno to UDOT link satisfies our preference to keep 70% of the first Fresnel zone clear.